Hello, and welcome to the fifth installment of the 2016 NSAR Summer Institute. I'm Ashley Stevens, a member of the NSAR Student and Trainee Committee, and a doctoral candidate at the University of Utah. The NSAR Summer Institute is a six-course online series presented by the International Society for Autism Research. The goal of the Summer Institute is to provide a forum for the presentation and discussion of autism-related research topics that is accessible for people new to the field. The Summer Institute was originally motivated by and conceptualized for early career researchers, specifically graduate students and postdocs, but is open to all those interested in autism research. We hope that the Summer Institute provides an opportunity for scientists with different backgrounds and from around the world to learn from each other and ultimately advance our understanding of autism. The Summer Institute sessions are free for everyone to attend live and are available to NSAR members for replay through the My NSAR account. This is the second year we've offered this training opportunity, and the theme for this year's presentation is familial aspects of autism. As I mentioned, today is the fifth session in our series and features a presentation from Dr. Patricia Howland, who will be talking about autism in adulthood. Please note that there are background materials for today's talk. If you haven't already, you can download these now at autism-insar.org. These materials define some of the key terms and provide suggested reading in the literature for today's presentation. As with all of the Summer Institute sessions, a group of trainees worked with Dr. Howland to prepare these course materials. The working group was led by Michelle Hugenhout, a doctoral student at the University of Cape Town. Other members of the working group who contributed to today's session are Ulia Mihaila, a doctoral student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Jessica Ringshaw, a postgraduate student at the University of Cape Town, and Amy Sai, a postgraduate student from the University of Cape Town. Before we get started, know that you can ask questions for Dr. Howland at any time. We will leave plenty of time for discussion during the second hour of the session. Ask a question at any time by using the chat window on the left of your screen, and we'll get to as many of them as possible during the discussion period. At the very end of the session, we will leave a few minutes to talk about career development. If you would like to get some advice about career development topics from Dr. Howland, please post your questions in the chat window and we will incorporate them into our discussion. We also greatly appreciate feedback from attendees. So when you end your session, please take a few moments to tell us about your experience today in the comments window. Now I would like to hand the session over to Michelle Huguenot. Thank you for joining us and welcome Michelle. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Patricia Harlan. Dr. Harlan is Emeritus Professor of Clinical Child Psychology at the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College London and Professor of Developmental Disability at the University of Sydney. Dr. Harlan has won the INSA Lifetime Achievement Award and the Kanner Asperger Medal from the German, Austrian and Swiss Society for Research in Autism Spectrum Conditions. She is founding editor of the journal Autism and a fellow of the British Psychological Society. She has served as chair of the UK Association of Child Psychology and Psychiatry and the Society for the Study of Behavioral Phenotypes. Her principal research interests focus on the long-term prognosis for individuals with autism and other developmental disorders and on developing intervention programs that may help to improve outcomes. So I would like to hand over to you, Dr. Harlan. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Ashley, and hello to everybody out there, wherever you are. My topic today is on what happens to adults with, with autism and as I'll indicate, the prospects for many people are not particularly positive, so I'll be looking at ways in which outcome more generally 
uh, could be improved in the future. Um, if we look at the, I'm just trying to get my slides up at the moment, and they're not moving. Okay, hopefully this will work. Just looking at um, the economic costs of autism alone, and that um, excludes, of course, all the emotional and psychological costs for individuals and their families. It's been, uh, research has suggested that the, the costs of autism are enormous. So studies in the US, for example, suggesting that the cost of autism is greater than the entire GDP of quite a lot of smaller countries. And estimates in the UK um, suggest that the costs are greater than for heart disease and cancer and stroke combined. And that's not just the, the cost of caring for the individuals with autism, but it's the cost to their families as well in terms of um, hours lost of work, um, the difficulties many families have in um, looking after and finding appropriate education for their sons and daughters, uh, and a myriad of other factors. And as I say, that um, cost doesn't take into account at all um, emotional costs and strain on families. Uh, it's also been shown that uh, much of these costs are related to adult needs um, because, of course, people with autism are adults with autism much longer than they are children with autism. So the costs go on for many, many more years. But also, uh, to some extent, the costs on families um, and individuals themselves uh, can increase with age. It's surprising, really, that so little research has been done on adults. Um, just taking this uh, particular slide, it's been very evident from figures from the CDC and elsewhere that there's been a huge rise in the diagnoses of autism over the years. So we've gone from figures uh, in the early days of about 4 per 10,000 uh, to the latest CDC estimates that uh, are reach as many as 1 in 68 individuals having autism. But at the same time as that huge rise in diagnoses, we failed to see any rise in the numbers of studies of individuals with, uh, of adults with autism. If you look at the bottom slide, for example, the, the, the bottom graph, you see the, the black bars refer to the numbers of participants of different ages in um, studies of, of autism more generally. And you can see that there's lots of cases involved in the sort of two to six to eight year olds group. Um, it goes down pretty quickly after adolescence. And by the time you're reaching the mid-20s, there's hardly uh, any uh, published literature on adults at all. So what does happen in adulthood? Um, from the, what, what do we know from the few, relatively few studies that have been conducted? I think it's always worthwhile going back to some of the earliest reports of autism. Um, I know Can has come in for a rather bad press uh, in recent months because of the Neurotribe book uh, by Silverman where he's been castigated um, on all sorts of grounds and for blaming parents and that sort of thing. I think that a lot of the messages in that book are um, ill-founded. Um, and I think that whatever one's views of the book are, it's clear that Canada did a great deal of work for people with autism and certainly brought um, uh, autism to, to the general knowledge of, of people. But as well as describing children, he also um, wrote a paper in the early 1970s about a follow-up of individuals he'd seen um, who uh, were now in their 20s and 30s. And he said in, in that paper that you know, he hadn't seen 
very many people, and he certainly couldn't do a statistical analysis of the results because of the small number involved. Um, but he pointed out the huge um, heterogeneity in autism and um, the, what he described as serious curiosities about how people have changed enormously um, from the way they were as children. So some people had deteriorated markedly as they moved into adulthood, whereas others had made huge um, improvements, um, e even though um, the autism still had an impact on them. So Tanner's early readings, are, uh, early writings, are well worth going back to for his descri earliest descriptions of adults. And subsequent studies have shown that, in fact, there's many positive things about uh, moving into adulthood. There's a number of references at the bottom of this slide, uh, but generally they're fairly consistent in showing you get a reduction in autism symptomatology over time. So there's decreases in things like repetitive and stereotype behaviors improvements in social reciprocity, and you also uh, get improvements in, in um, verbal skills very often and decreases in problem behaviors. So at an individual level, you find that many people have, have come a long way from um, the, how they were as children. The problem is that at a societal level, um, people just haven't kept up um, with all these changes uh, and all the opportunities for um, really taking part in society. So that um, a number of studies uh, looking at the transition to adulthood have shown that compared with uh, their peers, and that's not only peers in the general population, but um, peers with intellectual disabilities or emotional or behavioral or specific learning disabilities, young adults with a autism are significantly more socially and economically disadvantaged. So rates of social inclusion and employment are very low. And young people, young adults with autism are significantly more socially isolated they're more likely never to see or be called by friends or be invited to outside activities. And the uh, provision of day activities for them is far lower, of far lower quality than the provision they had when they were at school. Uh, and this gap between the quality of provision in childhood and the quality of provision in adulthood is particularly marked for adults uh, whose IQ is in the normal range. Because at least for individuals with autism and intellectual disability, um, there's usually some provision, at least in many countries, um, for some day provision for people with intellectual disabilities. If you've got autism and you don't have intellectual disability, in many countries, and that's certainly the case in the UK, um, there's hardly any specialist provision at all. So I think the overall conclusion is that outcome in adulthood for the vast majority of people with autism is very poor. And that's despite all the improvements we've seen uh, in intervention and educational programs for young children. So we've got some really nice uh, well-controlled studies now of interventions in early childhood, particularly the ones that focus on um, early um, social and communication skills between um, young children and, and their parents or other adults. But um, the impact of those programs still hasn't uh, spilled over into an impact on adult life. And for example, the next slide, this was a review we did a few years ago now, and we looked at um, the overall outcome of follow-up studies for adults um, in studies that were done um, uh, in the last century. So the first follow-up studies were done in the 1960s, and we looked at 
the ones through from 1960s to the end of that century. And then we looked at follow-up studies that have been done this century. Um, most of, to, to allow for comparison between studies, uh, most use admittedly rather crude ratings of poor, uh, people who are very dependent on others for their care, sort of moderate outcomes, and then good outcomes. So people who are working live independently and got families of their own and so forth. And just looking at those rather crude comparisons, you can see that actually there's been very little change in overall outcomes um, over the course of these years. So still probably the um, highest proportion of individuals being rated as having a poor or very poor outcome and remaining very, in, very dependent on others for care, and probably only around a quarter um, to 30% being rated as, as doing very well in adulthood. So things haven't changed much, despite, as I say, uh, these uh, really quite high quality um, early intervention programs that are now available. Now, there have been some uh, claims that very early interventions, uh, not so much the ones that I've um, portrayed on that slide, but the very intensive um, uh, early um, behavioral interventions have, do have an impact on adult life. So a few years ago, for example, there were claims that um, early intensive behavior intervention and by that I mean the programs the, uh, that were really introduced by Lovas and colleagues, the 40 hours a week uh, for at least two years. Uh, so uh, extensive programs in terms of both money and time claims that despite their expense, they would save uh, many millions of dollars over the lifespan um, because they would prevent uh, individuals needing special care subsequently. But in fact, unfortunately, there's no evidence that claims like that can be true um, because we simply lack evidence of any long-term impact uh, of these programs or a significant improvement in functioning in later childhood or adolescence. And most follow-up studies of intervention programs have been around um, a year. Um, and sometimes you find that the, in the early differences between treated and untreated groups tends to reduce with time. There's some positive findings after five to seven years follow-up. Um, but often the group differences are, are relatively small. And sometimes it seems that individual child baseline characteristics are more significant in predicting outcome um, than the actual program they were in. Um, but nevertheless, there, there's a big need now for much longer term follow-ups of these studies. But at the moment, we really don't know whether they have any um, major uh, effects subsequently on adult lives. The follow-up studies that have been done, um, whether or not people have been in interventions or not, tend to suggest that most participants still meet um, what used to be the old DSM diagnostic criteria for autism. So they will still meet criteria on either the social or the communication or the ritualistic and stereotype behaviors domains. And as I say, um, relatively few can be described as having good outcomes. We have got, however, these intriguing reports from uh, Deborah Fine's group uh, and also um, from uh, Cathy Lord's group of some individuals who have what have been described as optimal outcomes or very positive outcomes. In the past, there was some reference to recovery from autism, but on the whole, people have tended to um, stop using that term and use these other um, descriptives instead. But these are terms that have been used for individuals who, who now show no 
obvious signs of autism and they don't have any obvious signs of mental health problems, um, although they may have some subtle differences in social interaction or cognition or things like um, executive functioning that may still have um, uh, an impact on, on their ability to uh, function completely, independently, or successfully. Um, but we uh, still know very little about the factors that can help people uh, achieve uh, this, this very high level of functioning so that their autism is certainly much, much more subtle and um, in the eyes of many people who, who um, uh, may not know about autism, these people will now appear completely normal. Um, now, whether, uh, now, other uh, groups, of course, haven't found people who've been recovered to quite this extent, um, although, as I said, most studies will find people who are doing pretty well, but nevertheless, they still show uh, signs of, of autism. So it, it may be that there's something about these centers that have rather different diagnostic practices. It could still be that there has been some impact of early intervention, um, though um, there hasn't been systematic research on that over the longer term. And there's this um, suggestion, for example, by Kathy Lord's group and also uh, Deborah Fine's group that perhaps these young adults with so-called optimal outcomes may have been more likely to have been involved in some form of specialist program early on. The trouble is if you look at the extent of the interventions they had, in some cases these were so minimal that it's very hard to think that they would have a particularly um, strong effect years down the line. And it may be, of course, that their better outcomes are not associated at all with the particular programs that they, they had. And there's a whole mix of those, so there weren't any specific programs that seemed to be effective. But that it could be something about the families who uh, get their children involved in specialist programs early on, maybe um, the sorts of families who just help their children to uh, develop to their maximal potential. Um, and of course, it's very likely that family uh, factors play a huge role, but what um, their role is or what impact it has is something that uh, uh, we still need to know a great deal more about. So we don't really know much about the effects of childhood interventions. So what about the effects of adult interventions? Well, again, that's a very diff difficult question to answer because there's been so few um, child uh, adult interventions conducted at all. Um, and for example, Paul Shattuck a few years ago, they reviewed uh, huge numbers of studies on ASD more generally and only identified 23 that looked at interventions or services for adults. And more recently, Bishop Fitzpatrick and Nancy Minshew's group, they reviewed um, another, uh, over a thousand papers just on adults with autism that have been published since 1950 onwards. And they only find, found 13 uh, psychosocial other intervention studies that actually met basic experimental methodological criteria. So um, the evidence out there is very limited in quantity and unfortunately in quality as well. And a couple of recent reviews by the um, what we call NICE in the UK, that's the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality in the US. Uh, come to the same conclusions, that basically there's very, very few studies on adults. The uh, um, numbers of adult intervention papers are even smaller, and the ones that are of, of high quality um, are even less. So just looking at the um, 
nice conclusions. Um, I was part of the nice fat panel, so um, know quite a lot about how we, the, the conclusions were reached. Um, we looked at whether it was possible to recommend certain sorts of treatment for adults on the basis of the evidence without, that was out there. And looking at communication, all mice could conclude was there was no evidence for any specific intervention uh, to help communication skills in adults. There's suggestive evidence that augmentative communication systems may be useful, but really at the moment there's a lack of systematic research. On the whole, NICE was better at recommending things that people should not do rather than um, evidence-based therapies that they should try. And one of the ones that came out very negatively was facilitated communication. Um, the, the same sorts of conclusions really uh, emerged when you looked at programs for social skills. Um, the problems there being that the programs were very variable, um, mostly with high IQ individuals, and very little generalization to other settings or impact on other aspects of social and emotional skills. So very little evidence of improved functioning in real life settings. And there's quite a useful review there by Spain and Blaney that, that I've referred to. Um, you get the same situation if you look at interventions for ritualistic and stereotype behaviors. There's lots of single case or small group studies indicating the potential effectiveness of behavioral strategies in this area, but really very few adequate group comparisons or RCTs and certainly no evidence on which to base any specific recommendations for intervention. Um, the one other area that NICE looked into was the use of pharmaco pharmacology and various other interventions for um, autism, particularly for behavioral problems. And, um, one of the uh, particular recommendations there um, was that uh, medication should not be used to manage core autism symptoms or for behavioral management. Obviously, medication can be useful for um, coexisting conditions like epilepsy or depression or anxiety and so forth. But as far as managing the autism itself, there's no evidence that pharmacological interventions work. Um, the, um, and certainly if challenging behaviors um, occur, then the first line of intervention should be looking at the environment people are in and um, modifying that or using um, all kinds of psychological interventions. And then if they do fail and medication is needed, then medication should only be prescribed by specialists. It should be regularly monitored. And it should be discontinued if there were no response in six weeks. Now, I'm not sure about the situation across the US, but certainly in the UK, I'm afraid those guidelines are very often not followed. And what you tend to find is once people are placed on medication, and it doesn't work, um, they're simply given another medication and another and another. And um, people can re often remain on medication throughout their lives. The panel didn't find any evidence for things like exclusion diets or vitamins or minerals and supplements and so forth. Um, and uh, many of those more alternative programs um, it was recommended that they should not be tried, uh, partly because there's no evidence to support them, and also because of possible um, dangerous effects. Well, one of the things the panel did look at, because there's been a lot of publicity about it recently, it was the use of oxytocin. Um, I think the evidence that it has major therapeutic benefits 
um, of itself is is fairly limited. Um, although um, there's been some suggestion that it might be useful as an adjunct, say, to social skills training, it does seem to um, optimize social responsiveness at the time, and, and perhaps you know, a combination of social skills training and, and something like oxytocin uh, could be potentially valuable. Um, so, so that's a line of research that does need to be uh, looked at. But certainly the um, NICE panel, and I think most of the other follow-up studies that have been done on autism, um, for them, one of the major concerns has been mental health problems in adulthood. Very often you find that people's autism, as I said earlier, the symptoms in, uh, associated with that, have, have diminished quite considerably. But what is really holding people back in adulthood is their, their mental health problems, particularly anxiety and depression. And um, it's very obvious that these difficulties um, begin in childhood. And it's estimated, for example, that up to 70% of school-age children have clinical levels of psychopathology, and again, it tends to be anxiety types of problems that are particularly common. And in adulthood, it's the anxiety um, and also depression, but also things like OCD and phobias that tend to continue into adult lives. The problem is, in terms of um, working, uh, helping mental health problems in adults is that um, our instruments for diagnosing um, mental health in adults with autism are actually very poor. Um, so there's a huge variety, a huge variation in the estimates of mental health problems in adults. And I'll talk about, a bit about that later. Um, but of course, diagnostic rates are going to depend on the measures used and the systems used, as well as the age and the IQ of the cohort you're looking at. And one of the really, really big problems we've got here is um, not only do we not have any very good instruments for diagnosing mental health problems in adults, we actually haven't got any very good instruments for diagnosing autism in adults. Um, we've obviously got things like the ADI, which are very valuable um, and, and can certainly be used with adults, but only if you've got an informant who's known that person since the early years. And if you've got an adult who, uh, um, in whom a, um, autism seems to be the primary problem, but you haven't got family members, you haven't got early informants, then making a a reliable and valid diagnosis is really very difficult. So we've got the problems of diagnosing the autism in the first place, but then uh, the second problem is diagnosing the mental health problems. Because most studies of mental health problems in autism, um, adults, uh, adults with autism, have been done using child measures or, non, uh, or measures that would designed for the non-autism, non-intellectual disability population. Um, and if you um, try and compare, for example, uh, people's self-reports of mental health problems and informant reports of mental health problems, you often find very poor agreement between them. Um, but of course, self-report measures aren't good for individuals with autism who may have very little language um, or have problems in describing emotions and so forth, um, whereas informants may not be able to report on the internal states of the person with autism. So there's lots of issues there um, that uh, make reliable diagnosis um, uh, very difficult. There's, you also find this poor agreement between clinical diagnoses and questionnaire information. Um, so questionnaires tend to give you much higher rates than a good clinical diagnosis. 
Um, there's the issue of um, the overlap between the autism symptoms and symptoms associated with other problems like ADHD or OCD, which are also very common in autism. And of course, the presentation of things like depression in somebody with autism may be different from how it is in um, somebody who's not got autism. Um, so for example, um, depression may not necessarily be characterized by a loss of appetite or a change in sleeping patterns because the person with autism keeps to the same daily patterns that they've been in all the time. Uh, rather, it may be marked by um, increase in, in repetitive behaviors or agitation and so forth. And it's because of these difficulties, I think, that we find these ratings of major psychiatric diagnoses varying hugely from about 23, 25% in some studies to over 75% in others. And we still need to know much more about um, what um, exactly the, the rates um, are in order to be able to um, advise people um, appropriately. We don't want to be telling um, young adults with autism that they've got a, a 75 or 80 percent chance not only of having autism but having mental health problems if actually rates of mental health problems are, are much lower than that. Although there's disagreement about rates of overall rates of problems, there's better agreement about um, the types of problems that one tends to see. And it's pretty clear that the main difficulties are associated with anxiety and depression and OCD. It's also very clear that the emergence of these problems, in, um, which is often takes place in late teens or early adulthood, is related to environmental pressures, such as trying to cope with college or finding jobs or leaving home and so forth. Um, and much more needs to be looked at in terms of the environmental issues that may be um, certainly triggering off a lot of these um, mental health difficulties. What we do know, on the other hand, is that um, as mental health problems increase, uh, services for adults with autism tend to, to decrease. Um, so I've already mentioned the fact that uh, US studies particularly show that compared with peers with other sorts of difficulties, um, people with autism are much more socially and economically disadvantaged, uh, and the services for them, and particularly for people of normal IQ, are, are, are much poorer than they were in childhood. Um, we looked at in the NICE um, analysis of interventions that could be helpful for um, people with autism and mental health problems. Uh, NICE found that in people without autism, CBT types of strategies could be helpful, but actually uh, for people with autism themselves, the evidence for CBT was still very limited. Um, and NICE suggested there may well be adaptations to regular CBT that could be helpful and could make um, more effective interventions more widely available. Um, but from the evidence available, it was not possible to determine what those adaptations or modifications should be. Um, if you, there's been uh, some recent reviews of CBT, and there's a very useful meta-analysis by Spain and Italy last year. And they conclude that um, behavior, both behavioral, uh, cognitive, and mindfulness techniques could all be moderately effective for anxiety and depressive symptoms. But they point out that simple, sample sizes are often very small. You've got a huge range of different participants. Um, 
you've got um, different measures being used, mostly not measures of real life functioning. Um, and um, the, the biggest problem, uh, one of the biggest problems, was that what's described as CBT is hugely variable. And which um, aspects of CBT uh, work or don't work um, has still um, to, to be determined. And for example, um, we, said we just don't know what the active or important ingredients are. And I think this, this recent study by Hesselmark um, that actually compared CBT with just a good recreational activity program for adults with autism. Um, and they found that actually both groups reported better quality of life, um, and there wasn't any difference between the interventions. Um, Neither group showed a decline um, in clinical ratings of psychiatric symptoms, although probably the CBT group um, reported fewer symptoms on self-report. But essentially, very little difference between the two groups, which leads one to question whether actually some of the things that work in CBT are the structure and meeting in a group setting and actually having something to do um, with your life, um, which are often not available to many people with autism. So we still need um, a lot. Uh, we still need to know a great deal more about CBT, what works, um, who it works for, and most importantly, how to generalize the effects into um, uh, real life settings. Some of the research that's been done on children um, suggests that if CBT is going to work, you need to specifically address the ASD symptoms and the impacts of those first. So uh, trying to deal with the social and communication understanding problems and so forth, and the rather rigid um, belief patterns before you commence CBT for anxiety. And of course, the other big issue is uh, the need to change the environment. Many individuals with autism live um, in, in daily environments that are threatening, that are anxiety provoking, that are very distressing. And so depression and anxiety and OCD are unlikely to prove, improve if their everyday lives are threatening or stressful and isolated. So we really need, I think, to look at how we can improve the environment for people with autism, especially, particularly with, with adults. There's very be, there have been very few systematic studies of environmental factors that are associated with mental health uh, and behavior problems. But anecdotally, there's quite a lot of adult studies that suggest strong links with stress associated with major life events or transition points. And I've already mentioned the stress of leaving school, coping with exams or college or jobs and so forth. And also, of course, for many, many people, the structure that was helpful for them when they were in school just disappears when they leave school. Um, so you've got um, the lack of structure, lack of any useful or meaningful daytime activities for many, as well as disturbances in home life, as you know, family composition changes, family members may die or move, and so forth. And I do think that looking much more into um, environmental issues related to mental health uh, is, is, is a major um, uh, area for, for uh, new research that's needed. There's been some look at, at ways in which we, how we can improve the environment more generally. Um, so looking at social integration and um, Probably one of the main ways of doing this has been uh, looking at social skills programs. Now, the problems with these is that mostly they um, 
start to late in life. Um, they're based. They're not generally based in real life settings, although there are some um, um, uh, studies that have focused more on that. Um, and as I say, I think it's no good doing social skills training unless you're, you can also help modify people's environment. Um, and I've also uh, also <coughs> referred to the possibility of looking at adjuncts to uh, traditional social skills training programs, perhaps things like oxytocin, that might help to maintain or generalize the results. Because at the moment, the uh, evidence for long-term maintenance or generalization is poor. I want to go back just very briefly now to, um, to Kanner, because one of the things he pointed out that was really important in social integration and inclusion later um, was the um, helping people to use their special skills. Um, and it, he described these small group of individuals who'd done extremely well um, as adults. Um, and the thing that um, differentiated them from other individuals was partly having a, an IQ in the normal range, but also that they had particular preoccupations or special interests that then allowed them access to other groups of individuals with those same interests um, and, and uh, or where these skills could be used to enter the world of work. So using special skills um, is, is re and, and encouraging those is really, really important. And I think it's um, one of the people um, Kanner described, and this was in the 1970s, was um, a 36-year-old who was actually the first case that he described in his early case studies, called a man called Donald Triplett, who had been very, uh, very severely disturbed as a child, had needed residential care at some stage, but actually, as time had gone on, had made good progress. Um, he was helped to develop his particular preoccupations in a useful way, um, finished up working in a bank, um, took part in lots of community activities in his small um, uh, hometown, uh, was a golfer, um, also loved cars, um, and was really very much appreciated by um, his neighbors and the people he played, played golf with. And just um, a couple of years ago, a couple of journalists decided to see if they could um, uh, follow up Donald and see what had happened to him since. And sure enough, he was still living in the same little town, uh, still playing golf, still loved cars, especially Cadillacs, I think, and was doing extremely well. And that was somebody who'd never had um, access to specialist intervention programs or anything when he was young, but who had special skills and who was helped to, to use these in a useful way. And actually, other research has suggested that a significant proportion of people with autism have got um, special skills, there may be cognitive skills or computing or uh, drawing or number and a whole range of other uh, possibilities that could be of more um, used to them in um, having a, a fuller and more interesting adult life. The problem is that most people haven't been helped to make best use of these skills. Now, obviously, Temple Grandin, whose picture's there, she's somebody who was helped um, a great deal um, and who helped herself to use her special skills to uh, develop a very successful uh, career in life. Um, there's also this quite nice little book, I think, for um, especially for adolescents with Asperger's syndrome or higher functioning autism, about people who um, have or probably or possibly had um, autism and yet nevertheless have been able to develop their skills to a level that's been valuable not only for them, 
but for society as a whole. So the Different Like Me book is, is really quite a nice one to look at and can be really very good for adolescents who are feeling their way in the world. Um, so if you make good use of, of special skills, that's great. Um, but it doesn't always work. And, and the picture at the bottom of this slide, for example, is a young man who, called Gary McKinnon, um, who um, was very good, uh, somebody who's from the UK, fantastic computer skills, uh, but when he left school, no way of developing these further, no help to uh, find work and so forth. He got into a group of, in, uh, of hackers who were always hacking, trying to hack into other people's accounts. They were mostly looking for alien life, um, but uh, they also liked to hack into systems that were supposed to be unbreakable. And Gary hacked into the Pentagon in the US. And I always thought the US should have hired him instantly on the spot, um, but they weren't too happy with this, demanded his extradition from the UK. And we knew that if he was sent to America and ended up in jail in America, that would just be just, just terrible uh, for him. So a long, long extradition dispute between the UK and the US, which was finally successful in keeping him um, at home. But I think of a sad example there of somebody who had fantastic potential, but who was never helped to develop this potential. Um, another really important area is improving job prospects. And again, just going back in history and time, worthwhile looking at some of Asperger's early accounts of the people he described. Because he made the point, because of course he was talking about more able people, that um, in the vast majority of ca these cases, work performance could be excellent. And if you're in work, that increases your opportunities for um, social integration. And he also pointed out that very often um, successful job placements uh, involve people's special skills. The problem is that um, very few um, individuals actually make it into work, particularly high-skilled, professional, well-paid jobs. And overall, studies um, suggest that probably around 40 to 50% of individuals uh, remain unemployed. Um, there are schemes that can be helpful. Um, for example, uh, the uh, NICE panel found that supported employment uh, could help people um, into uh, finding and, and keeping jobs. It improved quality of life. And the cost effectiveness uh, compared with non-specialist schemes or things like um, sheltered workshops and so forth uh, was much better. So we ran a scheme some years ago and found we could get many more people into work uh, compared with just disability employment support services. Um, and that most of those people were in technical types of jobs. Um, that's the, the red uh, portion of the pie chart. Um, and uh, other people in sort of uh, accounting types of jobs. Uh, and uh, although it's still around a quarter, we're in uh, fairly um, uh, basic um, mechanical or um, very simple jobs. But nevertheless, you could increase not only numbers in jobs, but also the numbers in, in advanced technical work and very complicated job settings that required obsessionality and uh, checking behaviors and repetitive um, work uh, that may actually overload uh, non uh, people who didn't have autism could be very, uh, very well um, conducted by people with autism. The other area we need to be thinking of much more is how to improve the quality of life more generally. Uh, there's been little work on this. Um, I think it, it's generally considered that quality of life is, is poorer in adults with autism than other groups. Um, but there's no real evidence that it declines with age, for example, as it may do in, in non 
autistic aging populations, or that there's any relationship between quality of life and things like IQ or autism severity. The problem is, like mental health measures, we haven't really got any good measures of autism specific um, uh, quality of life. And I think we need to be careful about imposing non-autistic views of what's a good quality of life on uh, people with autism. So I think if you, um, some of the follow-up studies that have been done, for example, uh, suggests that people who are, um, have attained a good quality of life by standard measures, like, you know, are they in work, have they got families and so forth, may actually be individuals who are suffering uh, with more mental health problems. And um, a couple of years ago, Julie Lance Taylor pointed out that what we should be looking at is dispensing with um, rather stereotype views of what makes a good quality of life and looking at what they call their person environment fit. And Christopher Gilberg and his group in Sweden have developed a, an autism friendly environment rating scale, um, which they feel may be um, better able to um, quantify um, quality of life for people with autism than some of the um, existing measures. So quality of life, how we measure it, how we improve it, is yet another massive area for future research. I think um, you know, looking at current provision, um, what we really must need, uh, what we really do need to do is um, improve the extent and range and quality of adult provision more generally. There's lots of studies, not just in the autism field, but certainly in the UK, on the inadequacy of mental health services for young adults, um, especially at times of transition. Um, and that's for young adults generally. When you're looking at young adults with autism, the situation um, is, is even worse uh, with very little appropriate support from social or employment or other services. Very often support for adults tends to be very expensive because it's, it's just crisis management support. Um, you know, so when things go wrong, suddenly mental health services or forensic services have to be called in or sometimes people have to be uh, uh, placed in residential care. It's very often uncoordinated um, between different services or support, particularly for more able adults, is just often very non-existent. So you've got heavy reliance on families for support. So we need much greater awareness um, and training, of course, um, of health, people working in health and social and employment services about the needs and risks and difficulties of individuals with autism. And I think particularly those who are more able. There's a lot of talk about individualized care plans, um, but often these aren't individualized enough. And, and very often, I think for the adults I know who are higher functioning, it's not that they need intensive support. What they need is um, people they can contact if things go wrong, um, that they can get um, extra support is needed, but often that what's needed is fairly low intensive or intermittent. Um, it's just that they need somebody on the end of the phone or the computer that they can contact if they um, find things getting difficulty. difficult. And then also, as far as possible, to encourage local community support and understanding and inclusion. And just Finishing up with this picture, this is what's been called Autism's First Child. This is Donald um, Triplett, who as a child is very isolated, um, but, who's, but whose own skills and also the support of the community has allowed him as an almost 80-year-old now to live a very independent and fulfilled life. And just two... Um, 
more points. The, as I said to begin with, that um, the quality and quantity of adult research, particularly um, adult intervention research, is very poor. Michelle Dawson's a, a woman with autism who lives in Canada. She's a psychologist who blogs um, uh, constantly about the poor state of affairs in, in terms of um, research for um, autism generally. And she, she makes the case that bad science in autism research simply reflects an attitude of disrespect towards people with autism. And she concludes, and, and I think quite rightly, uh, that people with autism deserve better. And I think uh, for the future, there's many areas of research that need to be uh, pursued in order to improve people's lives uh, and the lives of, of their families. So thank you all for listening. Um, and I'll uh, now hand over to uh, Michelle and the rest of the team. Hi, this is Ashley. To you. Um, thank Dr. Howland for a wonderful presentation. Your talk has really stimulated a lot of questions. And so um, I am going to hand the session back to Michelle, who's going to moderate the question and answer session. So take it away. Thank you, Ashley. And thank you for that very insightful talk, Dr. Howland. Thank you to all those who sent in questions as well. We've received lots and lots of questions, so we might not be able to get to every question, but we will discuss the most frequently asked questions and try to get to all of them. So Dr. Harlan, you spoke a lot about interventions for adults with autism. Can you share your ideas on using virtual reality as an intervention for adults and children? Um, do you think it helps or hurts? For example, it might lessen anxiety when interacting with others to be able to do it online or on the computer, but it might also reinforce social difficulties and communication difficulties. What do you think about this? Um, great question. And obviously, um, all these computer uh, programs now, virtual reality, there's people doing fantastic work with robots as well, with little kids. Um, and they're, they're fascinating to see the uh, technical uh, skill of these things. And I think that you know, they're often really good for um, people with autism to use. They can make them feel more in control of certain types of, of social interactions. My concern is they are, they are very abnormal social interactions. Um, and I think that um, there's a danger that people get all, you know, very hung up on the techie aspects of it and don't think too much about, well, how are we going to sort of move this into real life settings? So I think that um, the, you know, the studies potentially show that these things can be valuable in, in teaching certain skills or helping people relax in in a, um, a two-way social interaction. What we've got to do is show that they, uh, you can use these then to help, say, you know, kids function better in the playground or people function better in the workplace. Uh, and that's the big challenge for now. So I do worry a bit that people get really hung up on those fantastic technical aspects and forget that um, you know virtual reality is just that. It's virtual. It's not real. Um, and it's moving from one to another, from, from one stage to the next. That's the crucial thing. Thank you. Very true. And staying on the theme of intervention, what is recommended for treating anxiety and depression in adults with ASD? Does limited insight into emotional state uh, preclude the use of CBT type therapy? Or um, are there things that need to be altered when using CBT? I think there's uh, probably an awful lot of things that, that need to be altered when using CBT. We're just not quite sure um, which ones need to um, are most important. It's clear that um, 
there's all sorts of contraindications in a way for CBT because you've got, um, you know, as the, as the question has clearly indicated, you've got problems of introspection and expressing feelings. And you've got to remember some people with autism even have difficulties describing physical pain. So, develop, so expressing emotional pain must be really, really difficult. You've got very concrete thinking styles, unusual emotional responses, you know, rigidity of thought processes, poor generalization, and so forth. So all these things, I'm sure, do have an impact on the success of CBT, particularly for less able people. Um, there's obviously, um, in, in other fields, it's been shown that using uh, visual cues, you know, social stories, the teach type of approach to education um, can be helpful. So I think the question is very right in saying we, we do need modifications, but quite what these are, how well they work, and what sort of people they work with are, are still big questions in the area. Um, and I think probably most people using CBT, it tends to be more heavily weighted towards the B bit, the behavioral bit, than the cognitive bit. And I think that's um, uh, probably quite right given the, the nature of autism. But as I said in the talk, what people, when people use the term CBT, they can be talking about hundreds of different techniques, and we use, need to tighten up what we mean by the term and what the um, components of these programs are before we can move on to explore the um, comparative effectiveness of these different programs. So I hope that is clearly on you. So that we can do on that research area. Moving over to diagnosis, and particularly for adults with normal intelligence, do you think that there are different features that clinicians should be looking out for when making a diagnosis in adulthood rather than in childhood? Um, diagnosis, of course, really, really depends on the um, on the history of the development of people's symptoms. And um, that's where the problem is, lies in making diagnoses of adults if you haven't got the diagnostic history. Um, because, of course, there are all sorts of conditions in adulthood, uh, severe mental health problems, psychosis, and that sort of thing, which might present a similar picture um, in adulthood to uh, someone with autism or severe depression. So that the adult picture of itself can be misleading. Um, and similarly, you can have adults who um, are very able to um, conduct themselves in, in interview situations, who um, seem at least superficially to have good language and reasonably good social understanding. But actually, if you go back into their history, you'll find the very characteristic uh, pattern of autism, autism difficulties in, in childhood. Um, so I, th I still think making a diagnosis just on the basis of adult presentation is um, is very difficult. You're very likely, unlikely, as a, a practitioner, for example, to see an adult of normal IQ with autism who's flapping their hands or jumping up and down and making odd noises, or who is very repetitive in their language, saying the same things over and over again. Their language may be repetitive, but it's repetitive in a more subtle way. So they may be repeating things they've heard on the news or from newspapers and so forth. Um, so these certain signs can be much more subtle in adulthood, um, particularly given the um, when you're working with people of, of normal IQ. I know people are trying to develop measures that work without a history, um, but I don't think we have any 
really satisfactory ones yet. I think self-report questionnaires are, um, need to be used with great care because, as I said, you get adults with other conditions who may also show similar sorts of problems, so they will score positively on some of these adult um, Asperger or autism questionnaires, that even though they don't have autism. So not very helpfully, I think my conclusion is really it's best to try and find a childhood informant. Um, if parents aren't around, siblings can often do a really good job in describing how things were when they, they were all children together. So I'm sorry if that's not a very helpful um, response. You spoke about the high comorbidity of autism with other somatic and psychiatric disorders. How much of low quality of life in persons affected by ASD is attributable specifically to autism rather than the other conditions? Ooh, I've got no idea, I'm afraid. Um, I think very often with um, higher ability individuals with autism, who uh, particularly those who have got uh, you know good language, particular skills um, that could be um, of great potential value in the workplace or other aspects of them, their lives. Um, it's the high. It seems to be the high levels of anxiety that are really holding them back um, rather than the, the autism. So I think, um, I wouldn't like to put a, fig a figure on it at all, but certainly anecdotally, um, many clinicians, and certainly I would feel that, is that it's the um, coexisting comorbid problems uh, that are the biggest problem for older, higher functioning individuals than the autism per se. But once you've got individuals who you know, don't have language or who are intellectually uh, much more impaired, then it's probably the, the autism is the, is the primary factor. Uh, but I think it depends very much on the, on the individual um, themselves and also, of course, the environment they're, they're in because you do see uh, individuals who are uh, quite intellectually disabled who in the right environment really function remarkably well. But if that environment changes or people in the environment change so it's less uh, satisfactory, then you see all the autism symptoms you know, um, uh, coming right to the fore again and um, they do much, much less well. Um, so I think it's a combination of environment, it's a combination of autism, and it's a combination of comorbid um, conditions like mental health problems or phobias and so forth. Um, and the, um, the weight of each one of those three variables can, can vary from individual uh, to individual and from time to time. Absolutely, and I think it's so important to look at the environmental aspect as well. So I love it that you spoke about local community support um, in your session. To what extent do you think stigma influences the fact that uh, adults with ASD experience so much more uh, difficulties with social inclusion than people with other disabilities? Um, I, I don't know how much stigma comes into it because um, I, I can really only talk from a, a, a UK or perhaps an Australian perspective, but actually there's, there's a lot of positive journalism about autism and, you know, what their potential is. And you've always got these, you know, uh, case studies that are published from time to time about people who've, you know, done really remarkably well. I don't think it's stigma so much um, as the fact that um, in autism, unlike, say, other conditions such as just um, general intellectual um, impairments, that um, you've got these very specific social difficulties in understanding and relating to other people. Um, so, you know, Dan's 
people with Down syndrome, for example, are more likely to seek out other people. They're more likely to belong to groups of other people with Down syndrome who are also sociable. Whereas, of course, um, if you've got autism, you may not want to belong to a group at all. If you belong to an autism group, well, that's you know, not there, there are limitations there in the amount of social interaction that, that um, may take place. I, I think it's more to do with the social, the specific social difficulties um, associated with autism and the lack of understanding of people in society um, about uh, the social difficulties of people with autism, particularly those who are more able. So the you know, your general public finds it very difficult to understand somebody who's got fantastic skills, you know, might be a great computer analyst or mathematician, but, but simply, you know, can't relate to other people um, at a very basic level. And that can make other people quite wary of them or just, you know, not really want to have much to do with them. So I, I don't know how much of it is stigma specifically or just the, you know, the very unusual social characteristics of people with autism that the rest of the world just doesn't understand properly. I want to pick up on that lack of understanding uh, or lack of awareness and ask how much research has been done to ask adults with autism themselves what they consider to be good quality of life. Um, there's surprisingly little systematic research. I think, you know, if you go to the various websites involving people with autism themselves, there's stacks of stuff on that about what people feel they need um, that would improve their lives. Now, obviously, the, you know, the internet, um, what improves one person's life may not be right for somebody else. So, so there's huge variation there. Um, but I, as I sort of indicated, I think the whole area of studying quality of life, what we need to look at and so forth, um, is, is, is open for, for much, much more research. And I, I think uh, clearly you can't do that research without involving people with autism in it. Now, some people are starting to do that. Um, um, Hilda Gertz, uh, for example, um, in Holland has, has done work on that. Uh, but her groups are very small. Um, and they tend to be only of people with an IQ in the normal range um, and a rather limited age range as well. So we need to, the input from many more people with autism um, and looking at um, issues much more uh, systematically. Uh, and, but I do think we, we've got to do that because otherwise we're in danger of imposing our ideas of what's a good quality of life uh, on other people. Uh, and just a, a very quick anecdote, if I may, they, I remember seeing a, <coughs> um, a woman some years ago who I'd known for a long time. She was doing really, really well with a job, lived independently and so forth. And she said the one thing that really upset her all the time was people just saying to her, oh, you've done really well, but wouldn't you like to have friends? Wouldn't you like to go out more? <coughs> Sorry. I've been talking too much. <coughs> People in there, that just shows how I'm like... I just had a coughing fit. And, and she was just saying, you know, people were trying to impose their ideas of what her life should be rather than just letting her enjoy the very good quality of life that she felt she'd achieved for herself. Absolutely. To go back to interventions for a moment, what are recommended interventions for working with an adult with ASD on improving social skills and individual therapy? And how can we address the heterogeneity in autism by intervention? Should we consider adapting other inter interventions? 
Um, I think certainly any interventions need to be adapted for, especially for people with autism. I, um, individual therapy, I think, can work well if it's an individual problem, like a you know mental health problem, or needing to discuss specific um, individual issues. Don't think individual therapy is going to help social skills more generally. And actually, I think that although the evidence is very limited, um, social interactions are improved if they're built around things that the person with autism or situations that the person with autism feels comfortable with or is good at. So if you can help people into work, then um, you can help develop their social interactions around the work or if they have particular hobbies or skills or special interests, mixing with other people with those same skills or special interests um, automatically gives you a, a common focus. Socializing just for the sake of socializing without that common interest or common activity is, I think, really very difficult. Um, so um, I think social skills training, for example, um, can be helpful in giving people in making people aware of basic rules of social interaction. Um, that there's really nothing that can replace um, practicing these skills in in real life settings with, with other people. Um, I mean, those, those groups may be the general population, or they may be um, other people with autism, but it's doing things in real life that's absolutely crucial. In terms of interventions for other types of problems, I think one needs to look at what you know, recommended treatments are, um, so um, you know, perhaps dealing with um, obsessional symptoms or phobias and that sort of thing, then looking at the recommended, recommended treatments for those in the general population um, and just working out how to um, apply those on an individual level. Um, but that involves people, you know, clinicians or others knowing a lot about autism and the sorts of adaptations that may be needed. And the other po important part of your question, of course, is um, concerns the issue of heterogeneity, that what works with one person with autism may well not work at all with another person of a very different intellectual level or verbal level and so forth. So it's really knowing the individual you're working with and his and her qualities and difficulties that's crucial before you adapt any more standard interventions for uh, particular problems. Thank you. I think that is so important. And the one thing that really came through in your presentation today is the clear need for more research in adulthood. What do you think are the main obstacles that are preventing research from doing more research in this area? And how can these obstacles be overcome? Uh, I suppose the biggest obstacle is money, actually, or lack of it. I mean, somehow, I don't know, perhaps children are more interesting to research-giving bodies than, um, than adults are, probably because you know, there's so much more potential for working with little children. And if you, you know, there's the idea if you get in early with families and with children, you can set um, things off on a different trajectory, uh, making, you know, if you make social communication between adults and children easier from an early age, this may then have um, huge um, repercussions down the line for many years to come. Um, so I think that you know people doing child research you always um, focus on this that this will have all sorts of uh, implications for later life. Although as I said in my talk, I think some of those claims are overstated. So I think it's just child research looks more interesting to grant giving bodies. Uh, children, of course, you know, much more um, winsome than than you know. 70-year-old adults, I guess. Um, but it, it's, um, it 
I think, you know, the battle is to persuade bargaining bodies in particular that people are adults with autism for many, many years and decades than they are children with autism. And that if you can um, develop interventions that help in early adult life, these may well have much longer impact than, uh, you know, say a two-year program when the child's uh, three or four years old. Um, but it, it's a battle, and um, it's a battle that needs to be fought. And one of the things I didn't really mention at all, of course, I was talking about adults more generally, what we know almost nothing about is um, older adults, um, you know, uh, aging processes in adults with autism. Uh, you know, do they show faster decline than um, other people? Or actually, are there some um, aspects of autism which may be a protective factor against dementia? Um, so there's all sorts of, you know, really important and crucial questions that need to be looked at. Um, but persuading grant-giving bodies that actually adults are just as important as children um, it's a real battle sometimes. And I haven't solved the problem, so I haven't, can't really answer you on that one. We had a quick question. You mentioned a researcher from the Netherlands, I think in the work on social intervention. Could you give us that name again, please? Sorry, did you hear that? I think I pressed the mute button by mistake. Oh, we didn't hear that. Okay, I'm sorry. Press the wrong button. The name of the person is Hilda Gertz. That's G-E-U-R-T-S, I think. And um, she, the, the, one of the references is on the later slides in my talk where, where I was talking about quality of life. So her name is down there. Wonderful. And with that, I'd like to move on to the career development section as the last part of our talk today. And you've had a really inspirational career working in autism. Can you tell us about your training background? How did your experiences influence your current work? Gosh, my training background, um, I actually started off doing, a long, long time ago, doing um, uh, English literature um, as my first degree. Um, I had great designs and thoughts of being a novelist, I think, in those days. Um, but I, I, um, I was also fascinated in the English literature about the psychology of, of both writers and the uh, uh, subjects they wrote about. And I over time, uh, I was also doing psychology as a secondary subject, and over time I tended to get more interested in the psychology, um, and also I found that being taught English literature was rather destroying my love of English literature, and I reckoned I could read books and poetry or write at home, um, and I'd be better devoting my time to going to lectures on psychology than English literature. So I got into a general psychology course, and then I uh, moved to London to study clinical psychology, um, where I trained at the, the Maudsley. Um, and that was a fantastic opportunity, because um, the, the Maudsley is, um, goes back to one of the oldest mental health hospitals, uh, mental, uh, mental um, or psychiatric hospitals in the UK, the Bethlehem Hospital, of which Maudsley is part, um, was established, um, uh, I've forgotten which century it was, probably about the 16th century in the UK, um, and has been uh, there on some site or other in London for um, hundreds of years. So it was had a remarkable background history, as well as uh, you know, very um, interesting clinicians, very interesting groups of patients. Um, and I, in my child placements there, I started working with children. 
And in those days, because very few people understood about autism, um, often children with autism were admitted to residential uh, hospital placements, as they were in the States at the time as well. So that's how I um, became interested in autism. As I say, I was working first with children, but then of course the children grew up, and that's how I got interested in, in working with um, adults. And I've, um, over the years, uh, continued involvement with adults, both clinically and research, although I've also um, continued being involved in programs, uh, research programs with children as well, looking at treatment trials and so forth. So that's a bit about my history, and I've gone on so long about that, I've forgotten what the, first part, the other part of your question was. That's great. I'm going to go on to the next one to ask, who has influenced you the most throughout your training and career development? Oh, um, without doubt, people with autism have been the greatest influence on my life. Um, but in terms of um, um, colleagues or other clinicians, um, when I first started at the Maudsley on my clinical training, the person running the course was um, someone called Monty Shapiro, who was um, just a fantastic influence in just bringing to uh, everyone's attention how it was humanity that was the most important thing. It was, it was seeing people's humanity, whatever, um, conditional problems they had, and, and always uh, respecting that and um, making that, putting that at the forefront of one's clinical work and research work and everything. So he was a big, big influence on um, my life and career generally. And then in the field of autism, really Michael Rotter has been, I've worked with him for many years um, uh, and his influence has, has been um, uh, huge. But there's also been lots and lots of colleagues along the way who've had um, a big influence um, on what I've done and, and how I've thought and so forth. And, you know, we've done, uh, with Michael Rutter, we were involved in a lot of long-term studies here. But I think, you know, we were always exchanging ideas with Cathy Lord's group, for example, who's also done a huge amount of work in that field. Um, and there's loads and loads of other people. And I, if I start mentioning any other names, I'll, I'll miss out lots of others. So I'll stop there. Um, but I guess the two main ones would be Monty Shapiro, just as how to view and treat other people as human, as human beings, and Michael Rutter in terms of his huge influence on, on autism research. And what a beautiful message there about not forgetting about the humanity of the people that we see. What was the key lesson that you learned as a young professional that sticks with you until today? Oh, gosh. Um, but, but probably that there aren't any easy solutions to, to anything. Um, sometimes as a young professional, I'd sit there when faced with a, um, a sort of uh, really difficult, say, family situation with a young child with autism. Uh, I'd be thinking, you know, oh gosh, if only I knew more, I'm sure there'd be um, an easy or straightforward way of answering this family's needs or, um, you know, helping them with their child with autism. Um, but as time's gone on, I've realized actually there aren't any um, easy solutions at all. Uh, with, you know, um, experience, you, you get a bit better at suggesting various possible ways that, that, uh, to help people. But I think, you know, um, everybody's different, families are different, um, the difficulty of the situations that families or individuals are in um, differ um, from one case to another and from time to time. So there are, basically there aren't any 
um, easy solutions and you just need to uh, really take into account all the variables you possibly can in the hope of coming up with a hypothesis and the potential solution uh, that may work, um, but always being prepared for the fact that it, it possibly won't or even probably won't work and that you're going to have to revise your ideas and revise your um, advice. Um, and that really, and that involves always be, you know, being as accessible to families as you can. So not just seeing them once and saying, you know, go away and do this, um, but assuming that probably it won't work as well as you thought, and they need to be able to come back and um, go over the situation again, and then you make new hypotheses and test these out. Um, and, and you carry on as an iterative process, really. But it's being available that's, that's really the crucial thing. Or knowing other people who can also help out in areas um, of expertise that are outside your own. What would you encourage young research to do to develop their career? Oof. Um, Gosh, that's hard. I mean, I think that um, life's got harder, if anything, in terms of developing research careers um, than it used to be. Um, you know, there's um, much more competition out there, and although the you know funding has improved considerably, it's not really kept pace. I I think I would advise any young researchers to make sure that they uh, try to get as much clinical knowledge of people with autism as possible um, in some way or another, perhaps sitting in on other people's clinics or you know, taking time to visit um, clinical units and so forth. Um, because I think it's very easy to sit in a sort of ivory tower and think up all sorts of wonderful schemes for research, which you know, it can be fascinating um, or highly technical, but actually might not actually make a real difference to people's lives. And I think it's only if you um, take part in, in sitting clinics or, or visit schools or residential placements and so forth that you see, you know, where the real problems are and what real solutions are needed. So my advice to be to young researchers would be don't just do research. Try and get out there and see what the real issues are for people's lives and see if by your research you can make um, improvements to, to those lives um, um, by the research you do. Speaking about doing real research, making real improvements, what has been your most rewarding accomplishment? Oh, I think, again, it, it's really on that theme. Um, I mean, I, you know, I've done quite a lot of randomized control trials and that sort of thing, um, and they're, they're satisfying. Um, but the trouble is with randomized group designs, they, they tell you what works on average. And you always know that, you know, uh, some people haven't responded to the program, um, or that you know some of your controls have done really well without you. So, randomised control trials are very satisfying from a, um, a sort of research basis or theoretical point of view. Um, but in terms of really changing people's lives, I, I think the um, supported employment scheme we ran was probably the most satisfying to me personally because there we saw you know people who'd never been employed or never employed successfully getting into jobs getting into really quite you know pretty sophisticated certainly jobs I couldn't do you know high-tech jobs or jobs in physics or that sort of thing and really seeing people uh, being able to meet their potential just by being given the you know a bit of support in the workplace, really to help their social skills rather than anything else, that for me was the most satisfying because I saw you know real benefits to real people um, rather than just looking at effect sizes and things like that um, as you do in a control trial. 
do you have some advice for uh, trainees and graduate students? What makes a trainee stand out as someone that you would like to mentor? Um, I think somebody who's got a, a real feel for the group of people they're working with, um, who um, knows what day-to-day -day, um, problems of life are for people with autism or, or their families. Um, and and I guess and, and just and who knows how to um, relate to um, individuals with autism and their families as well. I mean, some people are just much better than that than than others. Um, it, I wouldn't like even to define what what makes somebody able to relate well. Um, but but I, I think it, it's that that sort of feeling that you're you're interested in the people as well as the results of of the research and um, so I would want somebody who who um, wasn't just interested in effect sizes but was interested in real effects on people's lives and then I think you can go a long way both as a researcher and as a potential clinician. Always so important to remember. So on that, for the last question, I'm going to ask you, what's the best advice you've ever received? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, don't give up, I think, is probably the best advice. Just, just um, uh, when things go wrong, just learn from the mistakes, um, set up new hypotheses of, of um, what, um, what to do, um, work on things systematically, um, but, but trying to work on a hypothesis-based um, situation all the time. So if things go wrong, you work out why it's gone wrong, you uh, um, uh, try and set forward ideas or hypotheses for changing whatever has gone wrong and testing that out. But, so I think just don't give up, um, but uh, don't flounder around either. Try and have your, your next steps um, more based on the evidence of what went wrong from the previous steps. Don't give up and have a plan. Thank you very That's much. That's right. Dr. Yeah, you, you put it much more succinctly than I did. Thanks. Thank you for a fantastic session. It's been great having you on here. So, seeing that we're coming to the end of our time, I'm going to hand back over to Ashley to close. Thank you, Michelle. Um, on behalf of the INSAR Student and Trainee Committee, I'd like to end the session by thanking Dr. Howland, the working group. INSAR, and every one of you who's joined us live. Uh, I want to remind you that video replays are available to INSAR members for the entire six course series, including this one. You can become an INSAR member by visiting autism-insar.org. If you have questions or want to get more involved, you can contact the Student and Trainee Committee at studentcommittee-autism.org. We hope you've enjoyed this session of the 2016 INSAR Summer Institute Series. Please um, take a few moments to fill out the, the comments section after you close your ReadyTalk session. We're very eager for your feedback. And as a final reminder, don't forget to join us next week for our final session in this year's Summer Institute when John Constantino will discuss the broader autism phenotype. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful night.